Good morning, dear colleagues. I'm happy to see you all here today. My name is Kisilov Evgenia and I'm Cambridge Assessment English Methodologist. So today we're going to talk about Cambridge English Young Learners Qualifications as usual and we're going to talk about potential and common pitfalls that our candidates have during the exams and we'll look at some hints of how to avoid these pitfalls. All right, so shall we start, I guess. Uh, when we speak about Cambridge Young Learners qualifications, we all know that we mean that these are pre-A1 starters, A1 movers and A2 flyers. So if you look at Sephora, you can see the levels. So it's the basic level of uh, English language and uh, the age which we aim at is from seven up to 12 years old. So it's um, primary school and uh, the lower secondary level. So uh, today during the webinar, we are going to have a brief overview of the potential pitfalls and we're going to have them in three groups. So there would be format pitfalls, language pitfalls and psychological pitfalls. And later on, close, uh, closer to the end of the webinar, we'll have a look at some tips and ideas how to avoid them. We'll have a look at some strategies. So um, let's have a look at the format of our exams. So we uh, have all four skills tested here. It's going to be listening, speaking, reading and writing combined. And if you are already preparing your students for these exams, you've seen this table already, I think, many, many times. And each of these parts contain uh, some moments when our students make mistakes, even without realizing that. And we need to make sure that they know some uh, peculiarities of the format and uh, that would help them not to underperform during the exams. So let's have a look at some format pitfalls and I would like you to read through and tell me if you have how many of these pitfalls do you um, face when your students are being prepared for the exams. So how many of them do you face or you have faced or you think you might face? Is it more than one, more than five? Lots of them, okay. Doesn't, is there anyone who has faced all of them probably? So lots of them mentioned. Or you probably have never faced any. So your students are absolutely perfect and brilliant. So can you type in the chat your answer? Because as far as I can see, there's only one problem, six, okay. So at least two people from our audience have problems. Good to know. All right, so we're going to have a look at the tasks and we're going to have a look at what problems, which of these problems our students can face. Well, first of all, this is the listening task. It's the same for all levels. Uh, however, the difference is in the uh, complexity of the task. Yeah, you have uh, different pictures, different number of characters mentioned, different number of actions and uh, different uh, details. So what can go wrong here? It's the first part of the listening and could, uh, what, uh, what mistakes do your students make when they're doing these tasks? Can you type in the chat just a few of them? Which one do you face? What can go wrong? Anything? So do you can distract. Do you mean the picture like it's too colorful and beautiful? They just start looking at it and forget about the task, probably. Hmm. Can be. Uh-huh. Okay. Any other problems that your students, your candidates face?
right? Anything? Okay, so I'm going to tell you what my candidates uh, struggle with. I'm pretty sure you've seen this. So when you give our students a picture and you ask them to match something, especially if it's starters, for flyers it's much better, but not all the time, what they start doing is like, oh my God, I need to connect it. I have to make it beautiful and I will connect it in the most beautiful way that I can think of. What happens when uh, they are not properly trained? They come to the exam and they start doing the same. For the examiner, of course, the examiners are trying to do their best and they're trying to give as many points to our candidates as possible. But when they see this, it's absolutely impossible to understand who is who in this picture. Because even if you stop tracing this, you will fail at some point because you just can't do it and the candidates won't get any points for that. So uh, this is what I mean when I speak about straight lines. You can see it here. And it's really uh, important, it's crucial to uh, teach your students doing that. I mean, it's quite obvious for us as adults, but this is what happens during the exams. What else can go wrong here? You can see some names yeah, that you have to match to the person. And some of these names can be for both, for boys and for girls, and this is uh, also something your students should know. So such names as Sam, Kim, Alex and Pat are um, can be confusing for our students and they might think that Sam is only for a boy, however it's not. So make sure that these four names are for both. What else? If we speak about distractors, uh, it's not probably that obvious for the starters level, but for flyers you will see a lot of uh, pictures uh, and a lot of uh, characters in the pictures who do probably the same thing, but have they, they have different clothes. and there are slight differences between them. So these are called distractors. When they first hear um, a description of one character and they immediately match it to the person. Uh, there's also an extra name and your students should also know that they don't have to match all the names to the people because of course this is what they try to do. I mean, wow, there's one name left, I've done something wrong, I should probably choose a person and just randomly match it to the name. Okay, so this is a more complicated task, so this is for flyers, and when I was talking about distractors uh, for the previous slide, it is red here in this slide, and uh, this is when our students, their attention get distracted by something and they think, wow, this is the correct answer. And this is something I should do immediately. Then they just zone out. So uh, our task as teachers is to tell them that they have to listen it up to the end and they have to make sure that their answer is not something they pick for the first. So how can we as teachers make sure that this is something they can deal with? First of all, uh, when we're dealing with this type of task, we have to predict the content and that's why the picture is very helpful. Of course, it might distract their attention, but also it is very helpful for them to be able to activate what they already know, to remember the colors, to uh, pay attention to the details, and only after that start listening. So if you start doing it during your task, uh, during your exam preparation, they will do it automatically when they come to the exam. So you need to discuss all the possible options. What are the people doing? Uh, can it be this one or the other? And uh, also you need to practice noticing things. And how can you practice noticing when you're doing a listening task? So uh, it might be a good idea to ask them to listen to different tasks in groups, for example. And when a group, um, I don't know, if you have a group of 20 people, four of them listen to the colors, five of them listen to the ac action verbs, uh, others listen to types of clothes, and when they hear it, they need to stand up for example. So this is a good uh, idea of practicing noticing for listening and uh, also some kind of physical exercises for them. Right, let's have a look at the next slide. So uh, this is a different type of task. It's also a listening and this one is for flyers. 
So what can go wrong here? First of all, they tend to write more words than it's required. So read the task carefully and make sure that it's only the number of words which the task asks you to write. Also, sometimes when they write numbers, they try to write them in le uh, using letters. So please teach them not to do that. Of course, if they write it and if they write it correctly, it's going to be counted as a um, correct answer. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen all the time and such things as 14 or 40 or 8 might cause uh, different problems. So make sure they use digits instead of numbers. Uh, speaking about spelling, so it's a very common question. So uh, what about the spelling if they misspell the word? It has to be comprehensible and uh, some misspelling is allowed. So it will be um, taken as a correct answer. But for any part of the exam, uh, be it listening, uh, writing, reading, whatever. So if the word is spelled, if the word is given already, the spelling has to be correct. So it's a very important part for the assessment and it's a very important part for you as teachers. So when you teach them, teaching them uh, to spell the words, make sure they can copy them, make sure they know the um, letters, the names of letters. Okay, another type of uh, listening task is a matching one. So it's multiple matching and what can go wrong here? First of all, what causes uh, the problems? The pictures are in random order and our students face difficulties and um, they experience great difficulties with that because they start matching them as uh, they see them. However, they need to pay more attention to listening. And also they have to know that there are extra pictures and it's important not to try and squeeze them into the uh, box. What else is important here? Distractors, of course, some other things are mentioned and um, some similar pictures might be mentioned. So again, noticing and details. And also there's one thing which you probably don't pay attention to, but there are pauses between questions. And sometimes our students just think, okay, it's over. I've already heard everything I needed. And out of a sudden, there is the next speaker. So make sure they know about these pauses. It might be obvious for us, but sometimes they really face it uh, and they really see it as a difficulty. What can we do? Sort in, the yeah, it is. So what can we do to avoid that? First of all, when you're preparing them, teach them to look at all these pictures and try to predict what can the person do. For example, uh, the question here is, where did Uncle Robert get each of these things? Uh, the most logical thing for to start this task is to try and match, uh, probably not writing something, but trying to match the ideas. So where can you buy a painting? Can you buy it at the airport? Can you buy it at the market? So uh, where can you buy a fan? Again, is it a theater or is it the, um, I don't know, castle? So uh, first of all, each task needs a prediction stage. And after that, it's much easier for them. They already have some idea of what, of what might happen. It's easier for them to match them. You need to discuss all the possible options. Can you buy a fan at a castle? Yes or no. Can you buy a fan at a market, local market? You might if, it, if you are on holidays and uh, you're a tourist, for example. Can you buy it at the airport? Yes or no. If uh, you have already like uh, a high level group, well, high level like movers or flyers, they are uh, they are able to do that. And always check the answers. Always discuss why this is not correct. Sometimes you can even provide them uh, with a with a script just to show why things are this way, not the other. All right, let's move on. So, what can go wrong here? It's again a different type of task. And uh, what can go wrong? All the pictures are quite similar. The difference is the colors, uh, the colors of their clothes. However, even they are quite similar. Uh, the mustache is a difference. 
uh, the height of these people and probably their um, how fit they are. Well, so what happens here? Exactly, they should look for details and they again uh, they should read the question and they shouldn't pick the first possible option. So when you're teaching them listening uh, and even if you're not doing an exam like, uh, well, if you're not doing a task from some exam book, but you're doing any listening task, and if you're listening for the first time, ask them to answer some question, give them a question, uh, and the answer to this question should be somewhere closer to the end of it. So they will uh, learn how to listen, they will get this habit of listening it up to the end. It's very helpful for the exams because, again, the first thing they hear, then they just zone out. It happens, they are kids, so this is something uh, highly expected from them. And this is something we should deal with. Uh, please ask them uh, to self-check after the listening because they, they will listen to it twice and when they hear the correct answer or any answer uh, during the first listening, they just stop listening to it at all. So ask them to self-check during the second time or you might try um, asking them to swap their uh, answer sheets for the second time if you're sure about your students, if you see they're all ready and check each other or do it for the third listening. It's up to you and up to your students. Right. Oh, my favorite one. This is listening. You can uh, see here a task from stutters and a task, an example task from flyers. What is wrong? Can you type your answers in the chat? So what's wrong with these pictures? What difficulties have the students faced and uh, why will they not get their points? So the first and the second picture, what are the problems? Okay, I'm waiting for some answers, please. Right. So you either think everything is correct here, or what? Well, are there any problems? Too many details. Um, nice. I'm not sure I understand what you mean here. So uh, you can see here the tasks which have already been uh, completed. And what have our students done wrong? What went wrong here? choice <laughs> yes never give them a choice uh-huh you can see some balloons and you how many yeah there are two yellow balloons and two red balloons do you think it's possible at the exam during the listening part do you think they can ask them to color both balloons yellow All right, well, let's have a closer look then. And I will explain what I meant here. Well, what you can see here, <laughs> children, <laughs> yes, they are. And you have to think about their um, age characteristics before you start preparing them for the exams. So in the first picture, what, the prob what is the problem? Coloring more objects than required. So you give them a crayon, what they, do they start doing? Coloring everything they see. And this is exactly the problem here. So uh, when the examiner gets this paper, it's really difficult to identify whether the students knew the answer, whether the students just wanted to color things, or whether the student just colored some random objects here. And unfortunately, this is not going to be counted as a correct answer because 
you don't know what to count. Is this the correct answer or is this the correct answer? So it's not obvious whether the student really knew what is correct. So only ask, ask them to color only one object while they are listening with one color. So it is the only way possible. What else can go wrong here? Spelling. And if you see at the second if you look at the second picture, you will see that spelling here is wrong. It was supposed to be green and it was supposed to be G R E E N. However, the student just confused this, uh, the letters and you have double I here. It's not going to be counted as a correct answer. So make sure everything spelled is spelled correctly. I mean, everything spelled on the tape. What else can be a problem? Beautiful coloring is the problem. Again, they're kids and they, wow, we don't need to study grammar. We don't need to, uh, no, no, complete some gaps. We can draw, we can color. They are so excited about that, that they start coloring everything and they start coloring everything beautifully. This, this is what they are taught to do at schools. Color things beautifully and uh, within the limits of the object. What happens? They waste time. They start doing it beautifully, they don't hear the next thing. So how can we solve this problem? How can we help our students? You need to set a time limit. It doesn't matter if you're doing a listening task or if you are just saying and telling them what to color. Time limit, probably seven, 10 seconds for an object, that would be enough. Some teachers ask, can we stop the recording when uh, they are coloring something? Uh, I really think you shouldn't because otherwise uh, your pace of the lesson will start uh, to getting adapted to their pace and it should be vice versa. So they should try to get used to the pace of the recording. So time limit work, creative some perfectionist. Yes, time, it, it's actually crucial. Uh, what else is important here? Difficult letters, the so-called difficult letters. Uh, what do you think? What difficult letters stands for? So what does it stand for? What letters are difficult for our students when they're spelling words? From your experience, can you type something in the chat? So what are, uh, which letters can be hard for spelling? Do they have any? Anything? So I already have one example here. It's I and E, a very common problem. Uh-huh, so something when it's the language interf uh, yeah, language problems. Mm-hmm, so if Russian interferes here. Okay, so it could be I and E. It could be J and G, S and C. Some people even confuse A and I or A and Y. Yeah, language interference, exactly. So uh, these letters may cause difficulties. So make sure you practice a lot. Okay, the next group of problems that they might have is language. And this is exactly so, uh, this is something I've already told you, difficult letters, G, J, C, S, I, E. So spelling problems when they don't know how to spell the words. It can be not only for listening tasks, it can be for writing, it can be for um, reading, when they can't understand the word, when they don't know how it's uh, spelled. Articles can be a language problem too. Plural and singular forms. They also uh, experience problems with question words and some of them can't, dis well, they can distinguish with help, but sometimes they can get confused with when, where, uh, these are the most common, and sometimes uh, also what and which if they face it. Uh, to the group of language problems, I also would uh, take copying, 
because some of them just can't copy a word they start being creative for some reason and one of the most common and one of the most uh, let's say uh, one of the problems with that we as teachers uh, can um, it's the problem that okay let me paraphrase that this is something that we uh, this is our fault basically so we ask them to learn some phrases some ready-made phrases and this is what they produce during the exam it's always um, clear whether the phrase has been pre-prepared or whether the student has just made it uh, on the spot and let's have a closer look at these problems and see what um, where and when they can appear so it's the reading and writing part and let's see what can go wrong here first of all uh, they can start correcting the sentences and they think okay this is the exam and writing a yes or a no is not enough I have to write the whole sentence and I have to make it correct this is something they shouldn't do just a yes no is enough and uh, don't I will ask them not to do that and uh, you may practice it you may ask them why you think so why is it correct or not correct of course but uh, during the exam they shouldn't do that make sure they know about it also what might cause problems one element of the uh, of the sentence is wrong the whole sentence is wrong so they should write no sometimes they think okay but that's just one word the rest of it is okay no it's still wrong how can we as teachers help them first of all they have a picture it's a very powerful tool and uh, when you're preparing your students I've said that many many times already but visuals really work and visual uh, is something it's a component of your lesson which is uh, indisposable well so some prediction stage then they read for details they read for gist and then you might ask them to describe the picture it can be competition they can take some words from the text just uh, to uh, use them as some prompts if they don't have uh, enough imagination or they don't have enough language resource and just ask them to memorize the picture close it and then they have to say uh, as many sentences about it as they remember as they can remember as many details and you can give them points for that and see how many uh, see who has more well uh, or any other memory game you can think of that will help them identify what is right what is wrong here and uh, will help them to describe the pictures and in as many details as possible let's have a look at the next one so what can go wrong here first of all extra words pay attention that they don't have to use all of them uh, answering uh, the questions completing the gaps uh, and they should make sure that the words fit grammatically spelling has to be correct I've already mentioned that that if the word is given either in oral or in written form the spelling is given so they have to spell it correctly basically they just have to copy the word correctly they shouldn't lose any letters here or any articles if they have some okay the same problems here they need to match the word to the definition and it's a movers task when they still have visuals so copying has to be correct if they have uh, an article there the article should be in the answer uh, pay attention again to some extra words that might be there I'm not writing the number of the extra words because I'm just giving you an example of a type of a task and uh, for different levels of course the number of extra words is different how can we as teachers prepare them read the options and then read the um, the questions practice spelling all the words from the vocabulary list all the words are given and you have these vocabulary lists in the handbooks so all the words there can be can happen uh, at the exam and there aren't any words 
uh, that will just come out of the blue. So all of them are given. Okay, the other type of reading and writing task, and what can go wrong here, too many words, so make sure they know it's from one to three words for movers and one to, uh, one to four words for flyers. This is the number of words. They, they can't write five, they can't write, oh, I don't know, seven words here. It's inappropriate. If the word is given in the text, so it is given in the text, they should not change anything, just copy it basically. So no need to change or paraphrase anything at this level. Again, you have the visual for the preparation, a lot of prediction, uh, reading for gist for details. It's very helpful to underline questions or underline, I beg your pardon, underline the answers in the text and then just copy them basically. All right. And the last one from language problems for reading and writing. It's the writing task for flyers. We have three pictures. You have to write a story. What can go wrong here? Pre-prepared sentences. I've already mentioned, yeah, it is the hardest task, I know. Uh, this, is, this material is not taken from Starlight. This material is taken from the handbook. All right. So they use pre-prepared sentences, which are absolutely irrelevant to the pictures they see. So you can and you should, and you have to practice storytelling and story writing, but ask them to think about the pictures. So you should ask them to improvise as much as possible. What else can go wrong here? The pictures are uh, put in a progression. So you can see the progression of events here. Make sure you can see the progression in this story. So for this, use some linkers and you will see how um, you will see the order. Uh, not all three pictures are mentioned. It's also a problem for them and you can see it from the number of words. So the recommended number, if they don't have, if they don't man mention all the pictures, they won't have the recommended number of words or, and you can see it like not enough words, they can use too many words, which also can cause a problem because uh, they make, um, they use irrelevant information and it's not uh, about the pictures. So that can be a problem. And the last one is not comprehensible. So their handwriting has to be comprehensible. If they make some corrections, they have to be neat and nice. So for the uh, reader to understand the story, to understand the written word. You should, as teachers, practice writing in block letters because it's easier uh, if um, we compare it to cursive writing and it's more readable. Uh, also, what I would recommend for writing is using different checklists because uh, it helps them to understand what they have done wrong. And I've given some examples of checklists at our pre previous webinars. Just tick. I've mentioned all three pictures, tick. Uh, I can see the progression or uh, I used and then but, put a tick. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have some questions, can you write them in the question part in the special question chat because I might just miss them. And I will answer them uh, at the end of the webinar. So we we'll also have some psychological issues and we're going to talk about it also. So. What are the psychological problems? They are too nervous. It's normal for everyone, for adults too. They are too shy. It's more um, common for kids and not, not for if we compare with adults. And we all have this fear of making mistakes. Uh, most of us have been raised in the traditional educational system when we're punished for the mistakes. I've already mentioned it during the assessment webinar. And uh, we also teach our kids, we also count their problem and we say, this is wrong. Uh, and it's quite common for us. What should you do? First of all, pay attention to their success. This is right. Of course, you have some problems, but this part is beautifully made and is just almost perfection. Uh, so this is your feedback part. I'm 
starting from the end for some reason, don't know why. So let's go up then. Uh, they are too shy. What I would suggest as a solution to this problem, use some drama activities, ask them to become different characters that might be helpful, and this will help you to shift the focus. And these two are interconnected. When you shift the focus from the student and like this mistake is not mine, it's somebody else's, they don't have the fear and they become a bit less shy. And as a result of them, of that, they are not that nervous anymore. And speaking about being too nervous, uh, how can you help them? Try to motivate them. Explain uh, that the exams, it's not for punish, they're not for punishment. They are more for uh, showing that what they can do, showing their success. So we're going to have a close look at each of them. Being too nervous. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Uh, exams are for motivation and encouraging them for future learning. The exams can't be failed. Your students have to know that. Uh, it won't demotivate them, and uh, I'm pretty sure they won't stop studying, but they have to know that every candidate who takes the exam will pass. We're speaking only about young learners, of course. Also, what might be helpful for them, they should know that there's a lot of support for the examiners. You can watch some videos, you can show them some videos, and they will see that the examiners are trying to help all the time. The examiners are prompting them, the examiners are supporting them, and they're quite nice people, to be honest. So what can you do also? Have mock exams at the lessons. One student is a teacher, uh, one student is an examiner, the other student is the candidate. Role played can be helpful for being less nervous. And for you as teachers, try not to overcorrect them. This is what we tend to do, we want perfection. Don't expect perfection from young learners, you will never get it. Being too shy, I've already mentioned some drama activities like uh, things like uh, the other me or liar liar or one truth and a lie. They can help you to shift the focus from the student. Using different puppets. So this is our favorite monkey, Cambridge English monkey. And you can use this to talk to the student. You can give this monkey or any other puppet you have to the student and the student will uh, speak from uh, the monkey's heart. So um, it's really helpful uh, and it really uh, helps you to um, release some stress and tension. Okay. Cookie. Yeah, any any puppet you have. Uh, it depends on the book you're using or if there are no um, puppets, there are no characters correct connected to the book. You can have any toy or any doll in your classroom and just help them. Or, I don't know, a talking sock might help. Right. So one of the most um, useful tools is giving appropriate feedback to them if we're talking about uh, psychological issues. And I've got four examples of different feedbacks. Could you please choose the best one? There is one which is quite appropriate, only one. Is it A, B, C or D? What do you think? An example of good feedback. A, okay, C, uh-huh, we already have differences, C, mm-hmm, A, C, ooh, okay, you like C, what about B, quite a nice one, awesome, next please, or, okay, now let's look at your mistakes, very encouraging, isn't it? Yeah, I would agree that this is C. Um, a is a good example too, but you don't have enough information here. So if you compare A and C, you will see that you don't only have the praise here, but you also talk about precise moments of the speaking or writing or something, and uh, the student can understand what he or she has done wrong and what was correct, what was good about it. So I would suggest 
overcorrecting uh, it's when you correct any mistake they're making and uh, you don't have like delayed error correction but on the spot and you interfere with the speaking or you just point to the writing when they make mistakes so that is overcorrecting okay what can go wrong with speaking uh, the candidate doesn't understand the question ask them to uh, uh, teach them some phrases how they can uh, ask the candidate to repeat uh, Too long answers can lead to confusion. So one word answer is enough the crocodile problem That's my favorite. So uh, for example in this picture they are asked in this task in this particular task They ask to put the crocodile on the table many candidates starters candidate uh, stop feeling uh, like in uncomfortable because the crocodile just can't be on the table and uh, this is it happens because of some overcorrection or something else and they just can't do it so teach them to follow all these instructions of the examiners what can go wrong here I've already mentioned confusing WH words also your students might start asking these questions in random order uh, it's not a problem uh, in terms of uh, assessment but they may get, might get confused and uh, start asking the same question twice or just uh, omit something. So you may, uh, uh, as a preparation, you may um, first of all practice answering and asking questions in the correct order. You can use Cousin Rhodes to practice word order or just some I know some teachers use different trains which uh, are connected or other things which show the word order in the sentence. That's also highly important. What can go wrong here? It's a storytelling part. First of all, there's no one correct answer. So the story can go any way uh, the student wants. It just has to be uh, relevant to the pictures. So uh, the student doesn't mention all pictures. This also is a problem. And again, pre-prepared sentences. Don't use them, never. Okay, what can go wrong with this speaking part when they're supposed to answer personal questions? First of all, one word answers. Practice a lot of speaking, practice a lot of uh, real life speaking during your lessons and ask them to, uh, to tell about themselves. So no one word answers are expected. It's not the first part of the speaking, but they're expected to give longer utterances. If you look at the assessment criteria, you can see that. Students don't understand the question, ask them to uh, teach them how to ask for repetition and they don't know what to say. So in this case, lying is a good way out. So you can, I know this is something teachers should not say out loud, but teach them to lie because it's a, one of the important skills during the exam. Okay. So if you need some more information uh, about the exams, about the vocabulary lists or handbooks or the format, you can go to this website, it's mentioned here, and you can find all the relevant information about the exams. So, questions. Uh, have you got any? I can see some. So um, I've seen a question for washback. I don't really know the, the proper translation for that, I'm sorry. But wash bag, it's like you have the positive impression after something, you have the positive memories, and it encourages you to uh, go on. And if you speak about Cambridge exams, uh, they understand that there's a lot of support and they understand that they can't fail the exams. So as a result of that, uh, they want to take more and they, they're not afraid of using the language, which is probably the most important factor. So it's not if, uh, only about exams, it's about the language itself. So anything else? Any other questions? No. Okay. <laughs> Great. Then thank you very much for being uh, here today. And I hope your exam preparation uh, will be successful and you as teachers will, uh, yeah, will experience a lot of fun and pleasure for it, from it. So if you have any other questions, um, suggestions, complaints, whatever, you can contact me uh, on Facebook. 
what which book is my favorite? Oh, well, I have a couple of them, uh, but um, I would actually go for Kids Box. That would that's at the moment is my favorite for this page. Okay, great. Thank you very much, and well, probably Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and goodbye.